during uh, and after each each of the uh, the sessions. So in the the first session where we're looking at the the historical part where Eve is tracing this, Irad Malkin and Thomas Massan from the University of Tel Aviv and Oxford respectively. Um, we'll be discussing. So Irad is the full professor of ancient Greek history at Tel Aviv University and a member of the Academy of Athens. Uh, he's been a visiting professor at the Department of Classics in Oxford and I think is probably there at the, at the moment and is on the board of directors at the Rubin Academic Center and School of Maritime Studies. And then Tomas is a professor of modern history at Heidelberg University and co-director of the Cluster of Excellence for Asia and Europe in a Global Context, and director of the German Historical Institute in Paris. And Professor Massam works on the, the history of historiography and the history of political ideas. So it's going to be really interesting to hear both of their uh, perspectives on uh, Eve's work. So I don't know who wants to, to go first. I think, Tomas, you're, you're under some more time pressure, so perhaps we'll ask you to no, okay, so we'll ask Irad to... It will to be time first. pressure in one and a half hours, so for the... Oh, moment. in one and a half hours, ah. Don't worry, well, no. Perfect. Okay. Let's go chronologically then. <laughs> okay, so we'll ask Irad to, to go first then, please. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, especially in a subject that is very close to my heart, or has been for the last, uh, what is it, six years, uh, since I've noticed in my field, ancient history, there's hardly any subject that people haven't written about, except this one, <laughs> The Drawing of Lots. The last book on the subject was published in 1891, uh, and it's only confined to politics. Uh, recently, I finished a book together with Josine Bloch on the history of the drawing of lots, including three centuries that preceded the very idea of applying drawing lots to governance and politics and uh, democracy. In fact, you couldn't understand the role of the lots in democracy without those three centuries. Let me start by illustrating um, using Aristotle, uh, who says that the drawing of lots is what's characteristic of democracies vis-a-vis -vis elections that is more characteristic of oligarchies. And it's interesting that in famous, there are hardly any texts that extolling the virtues of democracy from antiquity. Uh, the, the, the famous one, the funeral speech of Pericles, he speaks about all the virtues of democracies, but he never mentions the drawing of lots. We have to understand the drawing of lots is not a value in and of itself. It's, uh, it's not. Uh, let me illustrate. Uh, in the 6th century BC, the people of the island state of Sifnos found a gold mine, and they decided to distribute equal portions of gold for every citizen for the next uh, at least century and a half. And Herodotus reports that you don't need to draw lots. If I give you $10 each, I don't, each $10 equal to the other one, right? So uh, the purpose is the, are the values of equality and fairness. The drawing of lots is the device to achieve that. Since most things are not, don't have a precise value, let me illustrate in the Odyssey already. By the way, there's a consistent line since the 8th century all the way down to the Hellenistic period. Uh, in the Odyssey, Odysseus distributes nine goats to each one of his ships by lot. Now, why does he need the lot? He can give nine goats to every ship. No, but if you are a sailor who gets the old skinny billy goat instead of the nice fat kid, you'll have resentment, right? So the drawing of lots achieves the notion of fairness and avoidance of resentment. Now we have this consistency of five categories of drawing lots, which I define as a distributive, uh, when you distribute portions of meat, sacrificial meat portions of land. Inheritance, there's no primogenitor in Greece. All the brothers get equal chance to get the same equal shares. Distribute uh, new plots in new settlements in colonies, for example. And booty, uh, whatnot. Um, you have selective lotteries, namely choosing in Homer a hero who will fight Hector, or uh, choosing uh, colonists for uh, ventures overseas. A house that has two brothers, there's a lottery, one brother goes out, not necessarily the elder one or anything like that. You have procedural lotteries, and Eve speaks about that in his book, uh, mentioning the case of the president of the Athenian council, De Boule, who changes every 
gets replaced every 24 hours by lot. So you have that you do have that in modern athletics as well, don't you? Um, what else? Yeah. Mixture lotteries, I'll come back to that very important uh, point, which I think is a little underplayed in uh, Eve's book, and uh, oracular or divination, uh, which uh, is a category apart. You go to the oracle and you, by drawing lots, you get a yes or no answer. Should you marry this woman or is this son really yours, for example? Yes or no by lot. So these five categories are very, very significant. You have to understand, especially with selective and distributive lotteries, that they define the contours of the community, who has access and who is excluded from that community. So the drawing of lots is a kind of horizontal vision. I was very happy that Eve is using that concept of horizontality. Uh, it also emphasizes the legitimacy of the procedure, as well as the legitimacy and the sovereignty of the group or the community that makes the decision to draw lots in order to achieve X, Y, or Z. Um, so all these things are very, very significant. The point is that it's the opposite of a top-down vision of society. It's the opposite of the top-down down vision of rulership and authority. In fact, the drawing of lots, I'll, we'll see another example in a minute, the drawing of lots uh, is, is, provides a horizontal vision of society and uh, uh, for whatever purpose. You have the concept of esto meson in Greek, to the middle, the concept of the, the middle that the French like Detienne and Vernon have emphasized so well is a vision as if the society is a big circle, you have a middle and things go in and out of that middle to, and radiate outside. And all this is done by, by drawing lots, okay? Um, it expresses an egalitarian mindset. And in fact, the, the, the title of the forthcoming book, my forthcoming book, is it has egalitarianism in it, from egalitarianism to democracy. So an egalitarian vision of the world, instead of the top bottom one. For a, it also expresses the horizon of expectations. For example, when a Greek would go and settle overseas, uh, people from the islands of Santorini, say, went to the island of Thera, on equal and fair terms, the key concepts, the key concepts are isos kai homoios, equal and like. Namely, nobody is actually equal to anybody else except in certain respects. Okay, as citizens, we all have equality in the respects of being citizens. We may be fat or thin, old or young, but equality consists in the respect to which you apply. So it creates a Greek horizon expectation which we should think about. And finally, first part is the notion of portion. Now, this is a little hard to grasp because. Um, for us, a portion is something very, very concrete, usually. But in Greek, meros is part or portion, or moira, which we usually translate as fate, but literally simply means a portion. So what you get is the notion that each person involved in the lottery uh, gets an equal portion of something. It could be a portion of meat, a portion of land, a portion of booty. And in fact, the verb to describe this is isomoiria, namely equal portions that we all get. And then the interesting po point is from isomoiria to isonomia, from equal concrete portions to equal abstract portions of nomos or law. We translate isonomia as equality before the law, which is fine for a translation, but is wrong in, in literal sense, because what it really means is that Every person has an equal portion of the law of the land. And that really is, actually, this is the first name of democracy. The, the name democracy doesn't appear before the mid-fifth century. The, 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 the regime was called isonomia, namely uh, equal portions for every citizen in contrast to what used to be there before. One of the interesting things, and one of the, the reasons why I think people did not write about the drawing of lots in antiquity so much, is uh, first of all, it was kind of the states, this taste is kind of gambling. We don't want lady luck to conduct our affairs, right? But there's some kind of a, a, the states that is involved because it's something, even the same terminology when you throw dice and you, and you draw lots. But the point is about religion. Why am I saying this? Because the last two major encyclopedia articles, nothing beyond that, 
always said, oh, okay, the Greeks turned to the lot in order to find what the gods wanted them to do, okay, in order to divine the will of the gods, which is not true. First of all, there's no word for religion in Greek. I mean, there's hardly in any language a word for religion. Religion, the concept of religion, as Jonathan Z. Smith has emphasized from Chicago, is really a, a modern construct in order to put together various phenomena that we either define as religious or not. Yes, um, in Hebrew, the word religion, that means law. It doesn't mean religion the way we mean it. Did the drawing of lots originate in divination? No, I don't think so. Um, the very fact that you have a category apart for lot oracles also makes that choice. But think of the, the very first lottery that we hear about in Homer as early as possible is not among human beings, but it's between the gods. You have Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon, three brothers, Olympians. They've just done a great war and revolution against the Titans, and they distribute the realms of the world by lot. That is how Zeus gets the heaven. That is why Poseidon is the lord of the sea, and that is why Hades is the master of the underworld. I am Isomoron, claims Poseidon indignantly. Uh, I have equal position, equal status, or literally equal portion. Now, when the Greeks imagined, of course, it's not really the gods who were doing that. When the Greeks imagined the gods doing it, they were reflecting human values and human practices and a human mindset onto the gods. When the gods were conducting a lottery, that was not divination. The gods do not expect to reveal the will of the gods because they are the gods, all right? So let's take that off the table and think of the presence of the gods in Greek religion. The gods are everywhere. The world is full of gods. This is a quote from the first philosopher ever, Thales of Miletus. The world is always full of gods. The, the world is pantheistic, but the question is, what do they actually do? If you look at the, how any political assembly in Athens, it's the assembly that in Athens, the ecclesia that, that passes laws, it's, that is not done by lot. The, every de declaration, every law of the assembly starts with the word theoi, exclamation mark, gods, exclamation mark. And then the next sentence is educato demo, the people has decided, not the gods. It's under the auspices of the gods. Of course, the gods preside over the ritual, not about the religion, the, reli the ritual. Even modern political bodies have rituals, don't they? Like the American Senate. The, the, the point is to distinguish between the two and not to fall into the trap that Jean-Pierre Vernon, the great, really, the great uh, 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 scholar of Greek religion, uh, he extolled la cité des raisons, the city of reason, where people convince each other and persuade each other. It's a constant dialogue. He doesn't even mention lotteries. But the point is that Greeks very rationally and very reasonably chose a random device in order to get at rational results. And that is the main point here. It completely missed. In fact, the very the very first act, and I should be finished in two or three minutes, the very first act of establishing the Athenian democracy was a grand lottery of mixture. And this is one of the points I would like to have seen develop more. Because what did Claystonists, the founder of democracy, do? It did something so complicated, nobody ever touched, dared touch it again. Otherwise, the whole thing would fall apart. But he did. He divided his country into three regions, each region into 10 units. He created 10 tribes, a third from each unit, so that an Athenian citizen who always lived in the mountain had his aristocrat as a neighbor and a powerful, suddenly found himself with somebody from the coast. In the same military and civil units, a unit from which every year, 50 persons by lot are sent to the Supreme Council to create a council of 500, which then, whose chair gets replaced every 24 hours by lot again, and the whole thing flips over the, for the next year, another kind of rotation. Hansen has calculated that 15% of all Athenian male citizens did something every year. Imagine how much you learn about your country if you are nominated to uh, the board to check the docks in the harbor of the Piraeus. 
Okay, you're there four times a year, not much more, but you learn so much more about your economy, your, your taxes, the va-et-vient in the port. And so in, in short, you're an involved citizen. And you meet other citizens, like just like in an American jury court, whom you never see otherwise in your life. And suddenly you talk to each other because modern society has been so fragmented into so-called tribes. It's, uh, you know, the theory of Mark Granovetter, the strength of weak ties. It's all, today we all have strong ties gone haywire through solar networks. We only talk to each other within the tribe. These kind of forcible mixture, there's a famous inscription. There's a civil strife, a small community, this is a third century Sicily, Nacone. You've got arbitrators coming from another city. They're actually putting the entire population in the same field, and then they choose by lot. A brother from one camp, another brother from another. And then they add to those two brothers, three more, provided they're not family members, from the entire community. And suddenly you have 60 ten, pentads of, uh, and of citizens who have to work together and not just argue about the things they disagree about, but talk about the docks in the Paris, for example. In short, uh, egalitarianism as mindset expressed in the practice of drawing lots in so many domains of life and sometimes of death, what is my lot upon this earth? I mean, sometimes in, in, we created a, a database of the vocabulary of lottery and much of it has to do with funeral orations about lot upon this earth. So you get this egalitarian mindset and again, it will be a mistake, I think, and I'm not charging either with that, to apply the notion of sortition from antiquity as a mere framework and mechanism without thinking the attendant values and the egalitarian mindset that were the substrate of all of that. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Yeraj. Um Lots of really interesting little bits there of uh, ancient history, which are just fascinating and fabulous to hear. So I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tomas, can we uh, turn to you now, please? I'm glad to do so. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. And thank you very much for the invitation, which gives me also the opportunity to uh, express my really deep admiration for what Eve has done, uh, written the book, uh, which covers uh, three millennia, uh, many different languages, which we usually do not speak or read, uh, geographically very vast, uh, including uh, China and India, at least for the parts, or already for the parts which I'm a little bit more uh, knowledgeable about, and uh, very interdisciplinary uh, as well. So congratulations. Uh, Eve, and I say that among others, uh, and you know that as a, a Swiss who is happy that Swiss cases are very prominent uh, in your book and as a scholar of republicanism, which is also quite important. And so I will speak on the two chapters which are dealing essentially with pre-modern Europe, chapters two and three. Uh, right ahead, I might say, uh, Eve, that I'm much more, even if I, I, I wasn't, uh, I, I only could look uh, quickly at your later chapters, I'm certainly less optimistic than you about the possibilities of using sortation in the 21st century to face democratic challenges, but we might come back to that later. I just wanted to uh, give you all here uh, while listening, maybe a moment of thought about the fact that in the University of Basel, where I graduated, in Switzerland, professors got uh, uh, chosen by lot in the 18th century, which those who were not uh, taken didn't really appreciate for quite understandable reasons. Um, but now we are rather, we will be rather speaking about the political uh, aspects. Uh, uh, another thing I would write, like to say right ahead is that um, uh, we, we might, uh, especially when it comes to the pre-modern times, distinguish between lot as a procedure, as a possible procedure among different procedures, uh, which is not the same thing as lot as a principle uh, based on convictions that, for example, everybody uh, could be equal. Um, we, there are many cases where uh, lot is used in very uh, elitist uh, contexts, especially in the Middle Ages. Uh, uh, Eve shows us that it's a phenomenon which is 
much more common, widespread uh, than we would uh, think. Uh, although he admits that there are not so many sources, at least not as much as he would like to. It's a Republican uh, phenomenon, although he also uh, shows a very interesting case in the Spanish context. Uh, and we have to keep in mind, you all know it, that uh, the Republican constitutions were neither dominant uh, in the uh, pre-modern times, nor a model. So it's uh, very, I mean, they might be for the, the Cambridge School by now, but uh, in their times they were discussed rather critically. So it's not part of a, of a political program, so to say, but rather of um, sometimes even accidental uh, solutions which uh, combine uh, other measures like elections itself, co-optation. Uh, there is little theory about uh, sortation, uh, but quite often rather sometimes even sophisticated, pragmatic solutions, uh, which allow to avoid also some problems which can go along with, uh, with sortation. And in general, and I think that's also an interesting remark of Eve, uh, this is um, uh, a practice which is used in rather stable uh, states. So it's not a reaction to crisis, but it's uh, a fundamental part of these uh, constitutions in, um, in, in the Middle Ages, uh, especially in cities, uh, of course. Why uh, are they uh, are these uh, governments uh, usually using uh, uh, sortition? Uh, three reasons given uh, by Eve, uh, limiting the re uh, five reasons, sorry, uh, limiting the repercussions of struggles for power, prestige, and resources. Uh, the, the second would be softening the psychological blow for those who were not selected. So both referring to distribution, uh, as it had already been said, and uh, the distribution of among citizens who consider themselves to be equal, uh, reducing the intensity of practices which were morally condemnable or even uh, illegal, such as factionalism and corruption. That's the third point. Uh, for lessening the negative impact of clientless relations on the ideal of a united political community governed by the common good. And uh, fifth, um, sometimes also to express the will of the Almighty. Um, especially or more in the Protestant context than in the Catholic uh, context. So you see the, uh, the sortition is not introduced to uh, as a tool to promote, uh, let's say, higher uh, political convictions and, and uh, uh, ideas or concepts, but rather as a, uh, a tool in uh, a procedure which has many different aspects and uh, many different aims. And uh, as to what uh, Ira just said, uh, the theoretical aspect uh, like Aristotle doesn't play a role at, almost uh, at all. So it's, it's no, not, not engaging with, uh, with uh, such discussion, discussions, but much more down to earth in general. The uh, third chapter, uh, and this is what, what I just said, I think is essentially true for the uh, so third chapter as well, which deals with the early modern times and can be uh, seen as an answer or as different answers actually to the question uh, Eve uh, asks at different moments also. Why did sortition disappear from the political stage while at the same time it established deep and lasting roots in the judiciary? And here it goes uh, from more or less the 17th to the 19th century. Uh, well, which could be this, these um, historical reasons, and I think this is really a, a wonderful part of scholarship, the discussion of existing theories and the, uh, the, the new ideas uh, you find in this book. Uh, uh, it takes his distance to um, positions, uh, notably Bernard Manin, uh, who would say that the, um, the sortition as a democratic tool is opposed to the uh, aristocratic and to some sense uh, meritocratic um, or aristocratic older traditions and meritocratic new uh, traditions. Uh, the, uh, the meritocratic uh, argument is certainly uh, uh, an important one in the whole, uh, in, in all what he's dealing with, but uh, against Manin, uh, he said that he wouldn't think that this is a very important aspect, nor, and this is the second issue he discusses, 
the well-known phenomenon that in the since the 18th late 18th century with the united states with france and so on the republican states become large territorial states with uh, with a big um, population uh, that is not by itself a reason why there could not be um, uh, a sortation uh, uh, according to eve uh, what is much more important and of course also linked to these phenomena is the uh, the political legitimacy of the state which is based in popular sovereignty uh, and representation uh, and this means that there are rational elections and consent of those who are represented so the sovereign uh, nation if you want uh, and uh, this uh, this leads to the conviction that the uh, that more or less irrational aspects like uh, sortition would be uh, are, are no longer uh, don't don't belong anymore to a, a, a democracy and would even rather go into the direction of the arbitrary and uh, and uh, uncont uncontrollable uh, ideas of direct democracies you have this these kind of discussions of course with the federalist papers uh, and the anti-federalists in the uh, us among the founding fathers which is a very uh, the fourth aspect um, was something we i will come back to that because it's uh, very stimulating i'm not sure whether it's uh, the um, uh, as strong as you say, uh, Eve, uh, starting from uh, Reinhard Koselleck's uh, idea of the, uh, the the space of experience uh, which societies have and the horizon of expectations, and that this changes, especially in the what the Germans call the subtle side, so the century between 1750 and 1850, uh, where the there is a, a shift from a lot as being a tool of providence to become uh, a synonym for blind chance and for uh, very arbitrary and irrational decisions and somehow in all this associated with the ancien regime uh, which was uh, ruled by traditions and by superstition and so on and in a truly rational liberal representative uh, uh, government and constitution uh, such tools should no longer have uh, any place anymore but and this would be the fifth uh, aspect uh, they should be able to cope with pluralism with conflict uh, even with uh, parties political parties which were something which was uh, kind of a horror to to pre-modern uh, thinkers uh, now, how do you face best with these divisions and with the strife which can pop up? Uh, you need elections and you need the whole procedure. You need this public sphere uh, and you have to uh, 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 so appeal to rationality and to um, solutions which are the product of rationality much more than to solutions which, see, which then also for those who have been the losers can be seen as not legitimate, not justified, because they are just the result, again, of blind chance. What uh, is uh, one of the main questions in, in, in this chapter for Eve is, uh, well, why, uh, if this happens in the political sphere, why do we have in the same time, so again, uh, in the, especially in the late 18th and in the, well, no, uh, already earlier, but in the 19th century as well, uh, um, why does the um, the, the sortition uh, pop up in the judici in judiciary sphere? So you all know that, and probably even much better than I do, uh, the jury uh, in um, uh, in court. Uh, that is what uh, Eve calls sometimes a contradiction, a paradox, uh, and uh, discusses it quite uh, for a long time. And I. Just want to underline that this is all uh, uh, there is there are very practical aspects of it but in the same time you read uh, very interesting paragraphs from uh, thinkers like uh, montesquieu uh, jean jacques rousseau uh, or hegel um, and this uh, is so most stimulating also when it comes to the field of uh, the political ideas uh, according to eve these uh, these um uh, interest for the sortition in the field of the judiciary uh, has two major reasons. One is that you have to be judged 
by people who are equal uh, to yourself. So you are in a, in a society where you it's difficult to accept an authority when it comes to these essential aspects. It's, it's easy, let's say, easier to obey in the political realm than to be judged and uh, to think that you have been judged unfairly if it's not by those who are uh, equal. And the procedure uh, in the jury aims at, at consensus, uh, which is not necessarily the case in the political realm, where you uh, where you are aiming at um, uh, decision uh, in the well among those who are um, who are involved in the government. I would uh, add, and I wouldn't. Uh, uh, that's not because Eve doesn't mention it, but I don't think he stresses it enough. I would add that in the judicial sphere uh, one very important aspect is that you have uh, the, the expertise of course also of the judge so you have legal expertise which goes with this if you want to say uh, you have an aristocratic aristocratic element or even a, a monarchical element uh, in this judicial constitution which goes along with the more democratic uh, aspect of the uh, of the jury and um, this is one uh, point where I would be glad to uh, go on discussing with Eve. I had um, some more, I think it's four uh, other aspects. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, why was selection by lot relegated uh, to the trash heap of history? That's uh, uh, the, the, the theme more or less of this chapter. I would not as much insist on this changing horizon of expectation, although I really liked uh, these pages. Uh, but if we stick to to Kozelek, um, how about uh, the space of experience, which means that the um, the success story of the lot is not so uh, deeply impressing. And I think in uh, collective memory, uh, People essentially, at least in the in the early modern times, they they had um, they had a big need for efficient government. And again, I would say that the, the founding fathers' uh, discussions is exactly about that. Uh, how can you combine uh, uh, the the need for efficient government, which cannot be the case if you have uh, like uh, thirteen or nowadays fifty different federal states, uh, with that everybody can do what he wants. Uh, on the other side, you have to cope with the danger of tyranny and so on. Uh, so, but that that's a, um, a, a major question. And in in this aspect, I don't think that for the thinkers of the 17th and especially 18th and 19th century, uh, sortition gave many good examples uh, when they would say, "Oh yes, uh, that's our historical experience, and we will refer to it and we will adapt it to our." Uh, needs. After all, and uh, I think it was uh, a very nice cita citation of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, competence matters. And you would not give your army to a general who has been elected uh, by, or exactly, who has not been elected, but, uh, but who has been chosen by the lot, because you would say, well, uh, it's just, my, what, what would the Ukraine do if, if the, uh, the general, uh, their, the leaders were uh, selected by the lot? So. Uh, competence, uh, as soon as you have, will need competence and more professional uh, leaders, it's quite obvious that you are uh, not so much uh, going for uh, the lot, but rather uh, for elections. The third aspect is closely linked to this and um, to the fact that you are, uh, in general, you would never take decisions by the lot. You would have elections. You choose people uh, uh, whom you consider to be more or less on the main, same level, and among them you make a selection. But you would never say, "Well, uh, should we declare war to uh, Mexico? Yes or no? Uh, well, let's 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 have just uh, a sortation, and then we will find out." And for even for much less important questions, uh, so the procedure is one which is very much focusing on uh, some uh, aspects of. Co-optation, after all, uh, and, and that's uh, how it's. Uh, that's also what, one reason why it was seen as something pre-modern for these uh, for these times uh, in the nineteenth century, and maybe rather uh, a negative tool, a tool that wanted to avoid strife and conflict, and not so much a positive 
in favor of a concrete uh, outcome in a democratic society. This happens, and this is my uh, fourth and uh, almost last uh, aspect, uh, always in societies and in groups and among groups which are predefined and pre-selected. So I don't see cases, um, at, at least in this uh, area, uh, now I'm not talking about uh, children or women to be included uh, in this study, but usually it, 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 these are property owners, uh, adult males, uh, so a, a rather, um, let's say, traditional and then so Republican first and then rather liberal concept of the citizen as a, a male uh, property owner uh, who is, first of all, independent, uh, and uh, which means that you can have sortition, but you need to have a minimum level uh, of those who are eligible. And of course, that's not, at least not what we uh, then have in the later 20th and uh, late, later 19th and 20th century. Um, where are we today? And uh, that will be certainly the rather topic of the, of the, um, the discussion in the next hour, next round. Uh, uh, but there was one moment uh, when you jumped from the uh, 19th century to the 21st century already in, in these pages, uh, saying that, uh, well, we, we have, as you show very well, the sortition is a tool of the left political parties in the 19th century, essentially, um, as is, by the way, the concept of the nation. And this shifts, uh, but rather late to the, to the right. And uh, in the 21st century, we have especially uh, right-wing political parties who are insisting on this. Uh, you mentioned Italy and France. Uh, this would be the case in uh, other countries as well. Uh, is it just, uh, as you say, a proof of political confusion uh, in our times that here something is not no, no longer uh, okay because uh, Eve, as a, uh, somebody who does not really belong to the right wing uh, parties, would prefer this, these tools, which he likes in the same time, to be promoted by rather uh, left-wing politicians like in the 19th century and there is no longer the case uh, in the 21st century. I'm afraid that we would really have to discuss this in a, a larger uh, frame and you will certainly do so and maybe uh, unfortunately when I have already left uh, because this goes really far beyond the challenge of uh, lots and of sortation itself. It is about the those who are promoting direct democracy and more uh, real, uh, more uh, wider uh, implication of the um, uh, different what, what they call people what the, the nation of many uh, uh, the many in in the political realm uh, but I think it's more that than just a hijacking of concepts uh, we we are living uh, in a time where uh, certainties which were quite clear to us, no, no, I do not have an answer to this, uh, and maybe it, when I will really have read thoroughly your last chapter, Eve, I will get this answer. Uh, but I just want to say that uh, we, uh, with, with this uh, topic and your wonderful book, we are in the midst of what is uh, an, an ongoing and sometimes even very frightening uh, discussion. And that's why I'm very glad to be with you uh, this afternoon and to can discuss it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Thomas. That's that's great, and for bringing it around for a link in the end to the uh, to the next session. So we we certainly will have a an interesting chat about that then. So um, if I can ask all the participants to please put your questions into Q and A, uh, and just while you're sharpening your pencils there, I'll ask uh, Eve to uh, give a, a brief response to. Uh, to our two fantastic speakers. Thank you, Jane. I also <clears throat> want to, to begin uh, with uh, thanks to all speakers and to the Ashente for organizing this uh, event. Um, very briefly to, to 
respond uh, to, to the comments uh, which have been made. Uh, one of the first aims of the book is to try to demonstrate that sortition was very important in politics in the past. Uh, it, is, it was comparable to elections. Um, and especially for democratic and republican history, political history, and especially if we think that elections were very often in the past not made from below, but from the top. Those who elected were those who were uh, the rulers, and they co-opted other persons, very often at least. So it was widespread, and we have to take this seriously. And what, for example, Irad is making for Athens should be made for also other uh, political communities in the past. And it is especially important at a time when, and we'll discuss this in the next uh, hour, our system based on elections and free competitive elections is in a deep legitimacy crisis. At that time, then we should think about the past to better understand the present and perhaps also the future. The second point, and it is quite clear when you confront an historian from Athens and an historian from the early modern period, is that sortition was not linked to one specific, only one specific political logic. It was democratic in Athens. And uh, I've proposed the, the, the concept of uh, distributive democracy to describe Athens, but this was not the case in Rome, and this was not the case in most early modern history. Why is it? It is because although sortition establishes an horizontal relation within a circle, if this circle is small, then it is aristocratic. And then in the early modern, most republics which used sortition were distributive aristocracies and not distributive democracies. It is because a procedure has no meaning beyond the social and political actors which are involved. And this is also true for elections. For example, elections with mass political parties and elections without mass political parties have a different meaning. Um, a third thing is that it was rational to use sortition. At least it, it was considered to be rational in quite different contexts. And this has been illustrated by Irad in Athens, but in a lot of uh, early modern republics, it was also considered rational to use sortition to tame the conflicts. But it was another rationality compared to the uses of sortition that we can have now, especially because the notion of random sampling was not available at that time. And because one of the major reasons for now using sorticians, namely what uh, has been called descriptive representation or sociological or statistical representation, was not conceivable uh, in the age of Pericles or of Rousseau and Montesquieu. So it was another rationality. And why did sortition disappear uh, at the age of French and American revolutions? I mean, we own Bernard Manin this question. It was a crucial question, I guess. And uh, it is because of him that a lot of people then uh, both scholars and, and uh, activists and citizens have discussed this. Uh, and I think that the most important answer is not democracy or aristocracy, because nobody defended sortition as a democratic tool at the end of French and American revolution. It was not because of this, but it was because there was another mindset, another, I would, I would uh, stick with the idea or, or reason uh, of expectation. Um, mm -hmm. What happened was that the idea that you can have a consensual political order vanished with the revolution. You had pluralism, you had conflicts 
which were which had to be integrated in a different way compared to the ancient republicanism. And the second dimension, which was also crucial, was the idea that the modern policy has to rely on sovereignty, choice, mandate, will, all concepts that seemed at odd with sortition. And sortition appeared outdated. And I guess that it's Condorcet more than Montesquieu Rousseau uh, who uh, saw this. He said, well, it was useful and rational in the past, but no, we are more enlightened. And now we have to integrate different perspectives. Um, and the last thing perhaps is that in history, as in the present, sortition doesn't function alone. In Athens, sortition was quite important, but was also coupled with the General Assembly of Citizens, with elections, with expertise. Um, and this is also the case now. I mean, the, the scope of uh, reintroducing sortition in politics, which has been pursued by, by a lot of practitioners and defended by activists and scholars, is not to reduce sortition, uh, politics to sortition, but to enlarge, complexify democracy, integrating other uh, devices and among others, um, sortition, but we'll come back on this. And uh, also to answer to, to Thomas' uh, critique, I guess that expertise is quite crucial in any policy. It was also crucial in Athens, but in Athens, for example, a lot of experts were public slaves so that they had no political power. Uh, they had expertise, but no political power. We can no more, unfortunately, have public uh, slaves as experts, uh, but we could couple expertise and this horizontal dimension uh, that Ihad was uh, speaking of. And I think that in this perspective, democratizing democracy in a period in which electoral democracy is in a structural crisis could be a good idea. May I jump in about the expertise? Because this has been, I'm sorry, my, my, my camera keeps uh, disappearing. Do you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Socrates, in one of Plato's dialogues, says that he prefers that the captain of his ship will not be chosen by lot, also what Thomas was saying, nor does he want the flautist to play music, the one who was chosen by lot. The Athenians disagreed. They would say that the Kubernetes, namely the, by the way, in Hebrew is the same word, the, the, the professional captain of the ship should be an expert. Above his head, you get the triarchos, which is another Athenian phenomenon. You, you take the higher echelon of economic society and you draw lots only among them, and 200 of them have to pay for a ship for a whole year and be its commander, okay? Uh, it's, it's striking. Athenians elected their generals, but the supreme command changed every day by lot. So you get the procedural lottery inserted into an election module. Uh, so uh, this kind of combination is fascinating because this is always the argument against drawing lots. It's not professional. It's not long term. Uh, it's it's open to haphazard idiots who might jump in into the body that decides it. Athenian said, "No, no, we never have twelve members of a jury. We have two hundred, or four hundred, or five hundred. So that idiot will be, you know, uh, marginalized." So the point is constant rotations, large number, huge involvement. And these are values also that we should think of when looking at so-called lessons from antiquity. I'm sorry to be speaking to you from a, a kind of a weird, ah, oh, no. Well, that's it for now. You know, that's so interesting. I had a thought on the expertise question as well. Um, which is that maybe, I mean, obviously in the period, I think in the periods that you're discussing, um, people didn't know about expected value and probability theory until, you know, after the 1950s. And so on the expertise question, so say you're in COVID and you think that there's a 70% chance that masks will help, 
but you don't know that. And there's a 30% chance that they will not. And then you're in the United States. The answer is not that every state should adopt mask policies if you really don't know. It's that 15% of them should have no masks or 30% should have no masks, 15 states, and uh, the other 70% should. And then how do you decide, right? Uh, it seems like a random allocation might not be a bad way to decide under that uncertainty because any particular state would certainly want to wear masks because there's a greater than 70% chance. But overall, if it doesn't work, that would be a bad outcome for uh, the nation as a whole. This is a kind of probability expected value informed version of um, uh, 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 of the expertise question, right? That's very true. I, I think the, the, the notion of, uh, uh, you know, modern kind of probability sampling didn't exist, nor did the notion of uh, political representation. You do have religious representation, representation sometimes in sacred embassies to great festivals. Um, they're as if representing uh, their community, but it's not an, a real notion of representation. Perhaps lucky for them, otherwise they would have uh, not used lotteries. Uh, incidentally, it, it's wrong to think of Athens as, Athens was exceptional, that's very true, and Eve is absolutely right there. But uh, now there's been studies of another 24 ancient democracies that use that. And what's interesting is that oligarchies, especially later oligarchies, also use that because basically it's the same idea, except the, the circle is far narrower, as, as Eve just, just had just said, uh, for later aristocracies. But oligarchies that can number sometimes 3,000 people, uh, there, I disappeared again, and have also isonomia, but in a very restricted sense. So the, the values of equality are there, but the application is to a narrower circle within which all are supposed to be equal. However, as Wibley said that already in the 19th century, oligarchies are based on the idea that people are really unequal to each other in terms of their qualities. It's forced equality from above because they don't want to fight each other. Democracy, on the other hand, assumes interchangeability of every citizen. Interchangeability signifies equality. May I also come in on uh, Arkan, what you just said? Um, and I think you are uh, absolutely right in describing uh, what happens uh, in, in such times, not only of crisis, but in general. I mean, we are, we are learning when we are looking at the others. And uh, we, if, if, if you look at, at COVID, uh, you could say what didn't happen, I'm not aware of it, at least uh, in the US, uh, because there were general rules for the 50 states, did happen, of course, on a global level. Uh, you had the Swedes uh, who took other decisions than most other countries, and then it was learning, uh, uh, learning uh, by doing or by not doing. Um, this, however, seems to, and, and we have some somehow more or less uh, uh, it's, uh, to, to, to these ways of coming to political solutions are also the constitution, whether they are federalist or whether they are centralist uh, in, in France. Uh, everybody thinks there is just one possible solution and the president uh, should know it. And if he if he doesn't, you throw stones against him uh, as, soon, as soon as you disagree. And in federalist states, you would be much more open to uh, procedures where you try and where you give uh, possibilities to different groups to to discover uh, different solutions. However, is this sortition? It is. Uh, these are ways to to cope with difference, with plurality, uh, and uh, solutions which are constitutional solutions which have been established and sometimes established in revolutions and sometimes established by. Uh, just constitutional lawyers who uh, were thinking about a good uh, um, a good way out. Uh, they all knew these cases we are discussing here. Uh, what Iran just mentioned. I mean, they they all had read the, their Aristotle's. They had they were especially in the older times when they were still reading Greek and Latin. Uh, this was their space of experience. Uh, now my point was against Eve. Uh, it's it's. Uh, you, of course, you can say it, it's a forgotten experience, but it actually wasn't. And you show us very well that in, in many uh, authors, it was not at all uh, uh, forgotten, but it was just not taken as a very convincing way out of the problems of the respective present times. 
And uh, I mean, I don't have to uh, tell you, it, it's just enough to uh, read some of the uh, Federalist letters to see how much the experience of the Greek uh, uh, democracies uh, and of the petty states of Italy and, uh, and uh, Switzerland and the Holy, German, uh, Holy Roman Empire are present and are discussed in these texts. So I would just say, uh, and I'm not against it at all, if, if France introduces uh, the, uh, the sortition also for choosing professors uh, in, the, in the universities of Paris, for example, uh, give it a try. Um, but there is some, I think, historical evidence that few people were really convinced about it for the reasons which were all given. I mean, not, not, not a big surprise. Uh, uh, Irad has just uh, repeated what many of the authors, which are quoted also in uh, his book, have put forward. They might be wrong, but it's not something which is uh, not which, which has not uh, been discussed. And now the times are, times are changing today, and then you have to see whether uh, old answers could uh, cope and suit for times which are changing. I'm not at all, uh, not at all against it, just uh, not at Basel University. Jane, if I if I may, just once one second. Sure. Uh, it's interesting that the founding fathers in the U.S. in America did not discuss the virtue or problems of sortition when they discussed about ancient republics. So it means that it was beyond the reasonable discussion, and this is why, I guess, the problem was not arguing against sortition because it was not efficient or because it was not giving enough uh, place to expertise. It was just another imaginary which was now outdated. It was so outdated that you should not even discuss it. And uh, this is my, my claim, at least. And I think that now the Roman Republic to a Greek democracy, it's quite clear, I think, in the United States. By the way, the better Roman historians come from the United States because they understand it so well. Um, Jenny, can I just ask, like, just thinking about your work on kind of recursive representation, do you have any kind of final thoughts here before we move on to uh, the next session? You're muted there, Jenny. You're muted, Jenny. I'll talk about recursive representation later. I have just one quick comment for Irad, which use, you use the word interchangeable. And I think by that you meant interchangeable legally, interchangeable abstractly, because of course, one of the great functions of bringing together a group of people through sortition is that they are very, very different. They're not at all interchangeable. They're bringing different perspectives and it's out of those different perspectives that you get uh, better solutions. So when you say interchangeable, I'm sure you mean legally interchangeable. Oh, absolutely. I, I would back off from the word interchangeable as a general word to describe sortition. No, no, I, I meant in terms of uh, one juror is interchangeable with another, another citizen. Yes, exactly, in, legally. In that sense. No, no, not that they're the whole point. You're absolutely right. I should Precisely. clarify that. Thank you. Yeah. Just wanted to clarify. Thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you all so much. I think that was a, a really lively discussion. So it was uh, really good fun. So thank you all for your contributions there. And so I think now just in the interest of uh, efficient timekeeping, we'll move on to the, to the second section um, where we will first have uh, Arkan Fung and then uh, Jenny Mansbridge. So uh, Arn Kong is the Winthrop Laffin McCormick Professor of Citizenship and Self-Government at the Harvard Kennedy School, and he co-directs the Transparency Policy Project and leads democratic governance programs at the Ash Center. And thank you to the Ash Center for uh, hosting us uh, here today. And his research explores uh, policies, practices, and institutional designs that deepen the quality of de democratic governance. And he focuses, of course, on public participation and deliberation. So he's really a, an ideal person to be uh, discussing this work of Eve. So we'll come to Arkan first and uh, then to Jenny. And I'll introduce Jenny at that point. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, 
I will share a few slides if that's okay. Just I, I think the the pictures uh, help me talk through this a little bit. So it picks up on uh, where we left off in the first hour. Um, and what I'd like to use my time to do is um, not so much critique the, the final two chapters or three chapters of the book, but rather to help articulate some of the reasons that Eves offers for uh, contemporary sortition, along with some of the examples and address this question of why now might be a good time to reconsider some of these tools. And he makes an argument in the opening chapter about the many weaknesses of representation uh, that may call for more sortition now. And I just like to draw some of that uh, um, connective tissue out a little bit more. And so the I'll, I'll begin with just the, our primary school sense of how representation and the policy process works. And um, the, so the structure of this argument is uh, from an article I wrote a long time ago uh, when there were far, far fewer sortition experiments uh, and ex examples out there. And I, I it was interesting for me to read East book and then think about this, this prior justification. Um, uh, as Tomas says, for what I regarded as a set of justifications for participatory and deliberative democracy, uh, far beyond sortition, but I'll address it to sortition here. And so the, the framework is uh, just very simple. Citizens have interests. They uh, develop policy preferences and political preferences to try to advance those interests. They issue signals in the form of a vote. That voting process generates mandates for politicians to uh, formulate policies and execute them, and that generates outcomes. And that's our representative process in um, the whole West and in much of Latin America and other places with representative government. And if this actual chain worked well or pretty well or perfectly, there would be no justification for participation outside of voting and no justification for uh, for policy experiments in sortition, I think, at least from a consequentialist perspective. Uh, trouble is it doesn't work well. And here are, uh, and so the, the structure of my comments is to say that sortition is appropriate when we identify places in which it doesn't work well. When I wrote this article way back when, um, most of the sortition and many of the deliberative experiments addressed this particular breakdown, which Eve discusses very well in um, in the volume. And the first breakdown is that oftentimes citizens don't have very sensible preferences in the political sphere to advance their interests just because they haven't thought about it very much. The problem is probably a little bit worse now with misinformation and um, and the kind of high noise to signal ratios that social media causes. And so even his book uh, kind of quotes um, Bourdieu, but then also uh, Philip Converse, the pu public opinion scholar, says similar things that the main problem with opinion polls is that they ask citizens to spontaneously reply to questions that they may never have asked themselves. It's kind of a non-opinion opinion is how some of the early public opinion scholars um, viewed this. And then so deliberative mini publics, the wave one that Eve articulated was meant mainly to address this problem, to create a space in which citizens can formulate deliberated, deliberated preferences that are just much more in line with what they regard their interests to be. And a lot of us wrote about these things back in the day, and I think there should be more of them. They're very, very good. Uh, Jim Fishkin, many other people have uh, have uh, created deliberative mini publics of, of different kinds. The second problem, and I think this aligns well with Eve's uh, radical democratic impulse, is to say, even if citizens vote and they have good preferences and they generate mandates, they often get politicians who just disregard what their real interests and preferences are in favors of donors or class elites or oligarchs or plutocrats. And so um, I think that uh, a good uh, piece of evidence for this, for people who haven't read it, is Marty Gillen's Affluence and Influence, where he takes decades of public opinion polls and he takes decades of federal legislation, and he shows that on issues in which those who are relatively well off have different policy preferences than people who are relatively less well off, 
federal policy is completely unresponsive to the median voter, but very, very responsive to the top 10% of the income distribution, right? And so there's lots of voting and lots of party competition occurring in this whole chain according throughout those decades. It's just that the politicians are not producing policies that are responsive to the bottom 90% of the income distribution. And so um, some people, myself included, have looked at sortition and other kinds of mini publics as a way to uh, address that problem of runaway politicians and political leaders who are untethered from public preferences, even when they're well formed. And uh, Eve, I think um, the example in your book that you develop most deeply to address the runaway politician problem, um, which is, I think, is the more the norm rather than the exception these days, at least in the United States is uh, the French Citizen Assembly on Climate, which I understand to be kind of a, uh, a bargain between uh, the Gilets jaunes who preferred an initiative and Macron who didn't want a citizen's initiative but couldn't quite uh, ignore the Gilets jaunes. So they created a sortition assembly which didn't quite rein in the politicians, but I think that was its intended purpose. Now, Irad's, I modified this slide after Irad's uh, remarks, there is a third deficit here in execution. So every, almost every local public po uh, purpose from educating children to uh, keeping neighborhoods safe to maintaining the environment in a sustainable way is not done by government alone. Um, it's oftentimes people say it's co-produced. That is, citizens have a big role in co-producing those public goods, whether it's parent teachers associations are just reading to your children in the education case or contributing to recycling or if you're more ambitious uh, joining a watershed association uh, and maintaining helping to maintain community water quality all of this is co-produced and it wasn't on the first version because I thought well most of that co-production happens through volunteers who are very into it they're not randomly selected they're kind of stakeholders um, and that's how it should occur because it requires a lot of work to co-produce these public goods. That is a form of participatory democracy, I thought, but not sortition. And then Irad's comment made me think, well, maybe it would be better with sortition because as we know, at least in the United States, one of the reasons for educational inequality is that parents of rich and upper middle class uh, in families invest a lot more time in co-producing and so you uh, education and so you get a very unequal political outcomes with geographic sorting you get the tribalism that you see in polarization so what if sortition were a mechanism in public service both at the community level and in national public service what have you randomly selected you know a thousand kids from Massachusetts to go to Louisiana to help clean up parks or build levees. And I think that uh, the Irad's comment about, well, you know, if you're an Athenian and you go inspect the docks four times a year, you get to know parts of your society and maybe citizens in your society, those who work in the docks and, and are in charge of rowing the galleys, you know, whatever, a little bit more than if you didn't have that random selection. So it kind of, uh, Irad, your comment really inspired me to think, well, maybe random selection in even this last stage of implementation and co-production would help out with us uh, to build some of what Bob Putnam has called bridging uh, social capital and would help create more opportunities for public service. So we know a, a big important kind of public service in the United States is Teach for America. We know that the kids who participate in Teach for America are primarily drawn from upper middle class and above parts of the income distribution. What if we just distributed Teach for America opportunities randomly? I think that would uh, have nice uh, distributive effects and it might also, I'm sure it would have also nice bridging social capital effects. Now, Here's a couple of other deficits that I didn't really consider in writing the article, just because the times have changed a lot. Um, these, the constitution writing mini publics, sortition mini publics and citizen assemblies had not really appeared yet. When I wrote the piece, the uh, British Columbia Citizen Assembly was just kind of getting off the ground. Um, and so I think a big important kind of sortition citizen assembly Eve, for you is the ones that have the job of helping to write constitutions. 
Because I think the last people we want writing constitutions are the elected representatives. When they write the rules of the game, they primarily do so, in my cynical view, to uh, entrench their own incumbency, whether it's at an individual level, a party level, or a sociological class level. I think we don't want that happening. Um, far better is for we the people to write the constitution. Obviously, all 300 million of we the people can't really have the pen. How do you do that? Maybe a sortition citizen assembly is a good way. Uh, a tiny example is the British Columbia Citizen Assembly. It was writing about what sort of electoral system should they move from winner take all to some kind of PR. Some uh, more ambitious ones, as you write about, are come from Iceland and the Irish Citizens Assembly. And Larry Lessig has a very nice piece in uh, the New York Review of Books proposing state level citizen assemblies for the US constitution making as a way to guard against runaway constitutional assemblies that might do crazy things. Um, it's really worth reading. So I think there is a growing, uh, very, very rapidly growing interest in sortition as a, as a mechanism of uh, citizen constituting citizen assemblies for the purposes of writing constitutions. And then um, Eve, I just had never thought about before I read your book, the role of sortition in managing excessive conflict. And it really made me um, think hard and was um, quite a new thought is maybe one of the best justifications for sortition assemblies is the Florentine justification is you've got warring clans and guilds and you want to distribute those positions at an elite level in a distributive aristoc aristocratic level in order to maintain a little more comedy because the tribes maybe are likely to be a little bit nicer to each other and have less anti form less antagonistic political preferences if they know that the rulemaking bodies of the empowered political bodies are gonna be randomly selected and they may not be part of that random selection in the next round, right? And so, um, uh, I, uh, you know, there's been a lot of, um, talk about Supreme Court reform in the United States. I think that the process of selecting Supreme Court justices has gone in a very bad direction. And, and everyone, I think just about everyone in the United States realizes it's uh, at least based as much on politics now as expertise, which is kind of the opposite. So it seems that, so you cite this example, uh, this proposal, which did not succeed in, in Switzerland, of selecting judges for the federal Supreme Court randomly. And, and so the idea is there would be a neutral body that would say, okay, all of these judges above a certain level of seniority and expertise are in the pool to become federal Supreme Court justices in Switzerland. And then when a seat opens up, why don't we select them randomly? So I love that as a proposal for the United States that might increase the legitimacy of the court, I think would certainly make it much less politicized than it, than it is currently. So why don't we allocate to the American Bar Association the job of creating a pool of 150 judges who they regard as the top judicial magistrates in the United States based on their track record, based on um, the decisions and the opinions that they've written. And the next time a position opens, we just select one randomly. And then maybe that would, I, I think that would, I don't know what knock-on effects that would have. I think it would have a lot of knock-on effects. In particular, I think that politicians would be far less um, ready to kick political de decisions that are properly political to the court because it would be much, much more difficult to predict what the outcomes of uh, the judges would be and, and whatever those outcomes would be, would be far less likely to be aligned with their political preferences qua politics. So I really, really thought that was a great suggestion for uh, managing excessive conflict in this highly polarized time that we're in. So I think that sortition has all kinds of possibilities for moving forward and more now than in the past because we know more about probability and statistics now than we did in the past because representative government is more broken now than in the past 
and because social and political conflict, at least in the United States, is far more well sorted and highly polarized than it was in the past. And for all of these reasons, I think sortition uh, is a very, very important uh, quiver in the arrow of democratic innovation. So thanks very much for your book, Eve. Really, really thought provoking. Thanks so much, Arkan. That's uh, that's fantastic, and thank you for the for the enthusiasm and the uh, and the great and the uh, the great ideas. I'll certainly be reading Lessig's piece in the New York Re Review of Books. Um, and for your Supreme Court, just to say, Graham Smith as well has said that uh, he died in uh, rotation, so that the the justices don't stay for uh, for life. Oh yeah, that would yeah. be good. But. Um, OK, we're going to move on now to Jenny Mansbridge. Uh, so she's the Charles F. Adams Professor of Political Leadership and Democratic uh, Values at Harvard and also co-editor of Volumes Beyond Self-Interest, Feminism, Deliberative Systems and Political ne Negotiation. Um, she's the former president of uh, APSA and received the Skype Prize. And Jenny also, of course, as everybody knows, works on representation and democratic deliberation and everyday activism. So I'm really looking forward to uh, to her contribution now. So please go ahead. Oh, uh, Jenny, you're muted. OK. Now I can reach you, sorry. Great, um, thank you. So I have a bunch of slides, many more than um, I should. And so I'm gonna rip through them. Um, I love this book. Um, I've got a quote on the back. It says, a riveting history packed with, I couldn't put it down. Of course, I had to put it down to sleep, to eat, to do a little bit of work, but I didn't want to put it down any anytime I, I did, had to. Um, so. I'm pushing various buttons and none of them are moving my slide. Um, damn it. Okay, good. Page down does it. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about why I think we are in a democratic crisis. I've written on this pretty extensively, so I'm going to go through it extremely quickly. Anybody who's interested, um, email me, jane underscore mansbridge at harvard.edu, and I'll send you a whole lot of references. Um, and then I'm going to talk ab about specific responses on the with the thought that some of the people attending this talk um, might not know a lot about specific things that are going on and would want to know them. And those who do know a lot about them, I've got a couple of comments that people might uh, like to hear. So the background to the crisis is really that we're increasingly interdependent, and that's creating an increasing need for free use goods, creates, creates free use Free rider problems, state coercion. I'm going to say what I mean by that. Okay, we're more interdependent than we used to be. Half the blueberries in the US in January come from Chile. That wasn't true when I was a kid. You got blueberries in blueberry season. Now you can have blueberries all day. Much less trivially, the climate. We know how interdependent we are. Now, as we, what a free use good is, as we get more interdependent, we're going to have more and more need for free use goods. And what those are, are things that once you produce them, everyone can benefit from it without paying. And this was the reason human beings invented the state. It was to create something that allowed us to produce free use goods. Because if you just depend on people to volunteer to pay, to, to let's say create a road or whatever, not enough people will get out there and make the road out of just goodwill. So you have to tax people. When you tax people, you have to get them to pay the taxes. So you have to have a fine, maybe even jail. That's the state. That's the state coercion coming in. Now, in a very small group, like your, I won't go into it, but just read what I'm, in a very small group, you don't need the state because you can do your sanctions reputationally. And of course, a lot of it is as Arkan pointed out, co-produced, uh, there's there's duty, there's feelings of solidarity, but you still need that coercion. So these free rider problems, which is that if everyone can benefit from with, without paying, that means you're going to need state coercion. And the problem with the increasing interdependence, the increasing amount of state coercion that we need, is that these 18th century democratic mechanisms we have aren't sufficient to 
to legitimate all that coercion. So for me, the biggest use of sortition is to increase that legitimacy, which is in such deficit right now. But it's also true that it produces better decisions uh, in some respects. These decisions are more attuned to citizens' needs, to reality on the ground. They weigh needs more equally. Maybe they're more creative. Maybe they're more common good. I take the fifth on that. And third, they instantiate and underscore equal respect among citizens. I think um, we heard about that in Greece. Um, it's it's a statement that we, tr we, I, Jenny, trust you as an equal citizen to go in there and deliberate for me. Um, now, all of these groups that have come up recently, most or almost all of them share a number of features. One is random selection, but two is stratification. And that's not understood by everyone. So to me, just uh, you need stratification because if you send out a whole bunch, you, you make a random selection, you send out a whole bunch of invitations to attend this meeting. The kinds of people who are going to say yes are going to be middle-class retirees. Well, that's not a representative group. So on top of asking people just randomly, you need to dig deeper into the randomized pool and make sure you've got things um, represented, excuse me, represented by um, education or class or ethnic occupational group, whatever is relevant to the subject at hand, age, gender. And many of these sortition groups don't yet put in, and I think they should, attitudes. So if you have a climate assembly, you should look at prior attitudes and you should make sure that you don't get volunteering for the assembly a whole bunch of pro-climate people. That's not representative. Um, so then when you get into the group, it usually alternates between expert testimony with Q&A and small group deliberation. The deliberation you've got to understand goes on in, the real deliberation goes on in these small groups of 13, possibly 15, 12. And then at the end, either you collect people's opinions and you look at the difference between the pre-opinion and the post-opinion, or you vote. Um, and it's the vote that we're going to be focusing on. And afterwards, there's a real problem. Because most of these groups that have gone so far, um, except for one, you know, except for the, for, for example, um, Ireland, um, and to some degree France, um, most of the citizens don't even know the group has been, has been formed. They have no idea what they say. And the problem is that uh, in the old newspaper days, what people would say in the newspapers is, if it bleeds, it leads. Meaning if it's got violence in it, it's got, it goes on the front page. It sells newspapers. Well, and the same thing is a little bit true in television and social media. If you've got a whole bunch of nice people sitting around talking about this and that, and you, on the other hand, the consideration of this and whatnot. And, but my experience is the following. That's not, that's just not something that's going to sell newspapers. So it's very hard to get attention to these groups. And so that's why a formal link to legislature administration is quite important. Um, so there's a bunch of things. Deliberative polls have no votes, only opinions. The citizens' assemblies have votes. Citizens' juries are smaller. I'm, I don't think much of them myself because they're too small to be representative. And then I might have a minute to talk about recursiveness. I forgot to notice my time. Um, so um, and the deliberative polls, they're large. This is very, very good. They're usually 200 or so. They've got strong incentives for the randomly selected. They're, they're often independent of government, although they're sometimes commissioned. Now, they're advisory, and Eve is not fond of advisory. But I want to say that they, because they're drawn by a certitian, they carry with them a lot of legitimacy. So that many decisions, and I'll just give a couple from some advisory groups. In Texas, the utilities commissioner uh, had a deliberative a whole group of people coming together, all these citizens by sortition. And they decided that Texas should have windmills. At the moment, Texas has more windmills per capita, capita than any other state in the union. And this is Texas. This is fossil fuel country. How did they get all these windmills in Texas? They got it through the legitimacy of granted advisory, but through, through the legitimacy of sortition. In Uganda, 
the, the authorities wanted to consolidate schools so that you could have science courses and things that would help the children advance educationally. They had a, a sortition uh, group um, came together. The citizens said, no, they don't want school consolidation because the girls would have to walk further. And that put them more open to rape and they wouldn't go to school. Oh, the authorities hadn't even thought of that. In Mongolia, the authorities wanted a new metro. The citizens got together and they said, no, we want to spend that money heating the schools. Very, very unflashy. Just heat the schools, please. In China, the authorities wanted a new town square. The citizens said, no, we're for sewage treatment. So I just want to point out that even those these were advisory, and, they, and Eve says, many publics must be empowered. Even though these were not empowered, they they had a lot of effect because of the intrinsic le legitimacy of the sortition. So citizens assemblies, which do have a vote, have many, many, and it's all experimental at this point. You know, one weekend, two weekends, many weekends, itinerant. I'll go into some of these. Um, some, are, some of them are, and a key contested feature is how linked these uh, sortition groups are going to, these many publics are going to be to the legislature. Some are fully independent, some are commissioned, but advisory, some are commissioned, but later there's a referendum. Some, they have no legislators in there at all because that they don't want any, 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 anybody who might intimidate the citizens. Others say, no, bring in some legislators. That'll give us both expertise in the group, but also a link to the parliament later and it'll get through, our stuff will get through. That was Ireland and they were, they were successful. Iceland was not. Sometimes there's an informal promise to implement <laughs> like Macron's infamous uh, pr promise uh, that, um, that these things would go, that they, they would be presented without filter. Um, you know, turned out that was a promise that was not a promise or a formal requirement to implement or give a public justification, why not? And I'm, I'll show you it in Belgium that, that the, what's happening in Belgium. It could be a second chamber of the legislature. There's no extant example of that. And there could be a replacement of all elected representatives by sortition. And there's only one person in scholar in the universe that um, promotes that. Um, so this is one I'm gonna just take a quick look at. But before I do, I just want to show you some of Eve's points. He says that these assemblies are new and more democratic form. I would say differently democratic, more democratic in many respects, but not in every single respect. It's more democratic because it does allow for this representation of these diverse viewpoints. And it does give a much fairer representation of subaltern groups. Um, and it should exist along with the others. So this is what happens in East Belgium. The parliament, I'm not going to walk you through this insanely difficult uh, 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 um, figure, but basically the parliament on the left uh, mandates, uh, has as part of the parliament now, this is in East Belgium. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of East Belgium. I had never heard of East Belgium until they uh, started this this. Um, um, way of doing things. They've, their population is only 77,000. It's smaller than the city of Cambridge. Um, so, you know, we're not talking big, big countries here, but you don't have to be, size is not all that relevant. They're doing this in part because they wanted to be first and they're working out the, as we speak, they've had several of them and they're working out the, some of the kinks in, the, in it. But the point is that when these citizens assemblies on the right-hand side that are now legally mandated, um, when they come up with a, a recommendation, Parliament is legally required to either accept that or give a public justification why not. And I think that's a great formula that we should keep in mind. There are other experiments going on. Here's one from Bogota where it's got an itinerant. The first chapter, a bunch of people gets together, 92 randomly chosen citizens, and they come up with an agenda. What should the next assembly discuss. Then there's the next assembly and that does discuss and decide. And then there will be a third assembly, which, and when it decides it goes to, the, goes to the city council and they're supposed to implement it. And then there'll be a third uh, uh, one, which then evaluates it. It's not the same group of people, but there's some people, there's some members that are moved from one to the other. 
My point in showing this is only to say that there are many functions here, and we're in a in we're in a massively experimental phase of doing these things. Um, there's also a couple of experiments in what I call recursive representation, and these are very consultative, not at all empowered, but there's they're still interesting in what they tell the representatives and what they tell the citizens. So that 175 constituents can come together for just one hour discussing a topic on the internet with some member of Congress. Um, but it, it means that those people who do that then later talk politics more. They talk about the they talk about the assembly, the hour that they spent with uh, lots of people, one point one and a half people on average, um, and they they are uh, they are more likely to vote in the next, next next election. They become more thoughtful citizens. Now, if every member of Congress did that for two hours a week um, in six years, they could cover a quarter of their constituents. If they did it for more than two hours a week, they could could cover more. If we did this as a general matter, um, as a supplement to representation, all of us could have had this experience uh, at least once or twice in our lives. Um, another version of this, much more deliberative, is that in the German parliament now, and we don't have data on what ha has actually happened, the single member district representatives, can they're being given enough money to draw a, a group of about 30 of their constituents randomly to come and discuss for a day with that representative issues around, a, a, you know, the issues that they, uh, around a particular uh, question. So again, no empirical data, but but I'm trying to show you the inventiveness that this, this sortition mechanism has started. So to conclude, um, well, Eve wants us but Eve pr proposes at the end, democracy 3.0. I'm not 100% sure what democracy 3.0 consists of, but it definitely consists of more sortition uh, assemblies and, and empowered ones. Um, but I think we ought to note that today's citizens don't want empowered assemblies. In the one survey that's been done, one good survey that's been done, that citizens say, that they approve of large, sort large assemblies drawn by sortition. They approve of the ones that are uh, that have that decide by supermajority, not by majority. They approve of the ones that have that mix parliamentarians and citizens, and they approve of the ones that are not binding. They have strong opinions that they don't want binding. Um, that is to say, empowered uh, many publics. So. Um, <laughs> there's a way, uh, there's a way, Eve, in which you might be making an elitist uh, demand um, of sort of forcing down the citizens' throats something that they uh, they actually are rejecting. So, can we do something less than uh, empowered mini publics? I think we can work on the Belgian model, the East Belgian model, um, and I think we can experiment. I think we can move toward empowerment. I'm not sure how much of a dent in the legitimacy crisis it, it will make, but it could make. I agree with Eve that this is a major, major tool in possibly uh, possibly producing more legitimacy in a moment that we need. Now, these things are very expensive. Um, the last one in the US, the last deliberative poll was $3 million. And that's because there were 500 people. You don't need that. You could have $1.5 million for the right number of people. But um, if you're really going to try to pull in those people who don't want to come, who, who are hesitant, and those are precisely the ones that make a really representative sample, that's expensive. So if it's really expensive, when should you, where should you focus your energy? We've already spoken about moments when the legislatures themselves are not impartial, when it's a matter of defining the political rules, when it's a matter of constitutional reform. Also, when there's a deadlock or failure to move, like Ireland on abortion, highly controversial issues. These quotes are from Eve. A reform. Um, hot potato is actually my 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 words. Um, in Rome, they had to, to they had to reduce the number of hospital beds. No politician's mm -hmm. going to want to do that. Um, so they had a um, a deliberative assembly on it, um, and the citizens decided, and that allowed the politicians to sort of say, look, the citizens came up with this formula, not me. 
And then finally, another time when we might need it is to legislate, as this is Eve, quote from Eve, legislate into the future. These are all quotes from page 274. And I think these are, we, we need to think contextually, we need to, need to think contingently, when do we most need these? And just one final thought, or no two final thoughts, but one, so nobody much has mentioned this, but these groups tend to come out with more progressive conclusions. Now, so far, even though a few of them have been pretty, pretty well publicized, Ireland and France, um, so far, they haven't been attacked. But if we start doing more and more of them, it'll become more and more clear that they are coming out to progressive conclusions, except when money's concerned. And then they're more likely to move in a conservative direction. I just want to throw it out there that we should put both kinds of issues so there's movement in both directions. Now, I just want to conclude with Eve's point. This volume argues that sortition is an invaluable asset for the future. And I would say yes. And I would also say this volume is an invaluable essay, asset for understanding sortition. So, thanks. Thank you, Jenny. That was that was great. A real uh, whistle stop tour through uh, everything that is happening now with some really nice and interesting insights. So I see we've um, there's a few people have already started to put some questions into Q and A. So I'd encourage other people to continue doing so. But uh, maybe Eve, if you'd want, like to give a, a very brief response to. Uh... Yes, very, very, very short answers. Uh, first, I also want to thank the two European projects, uh, COVID and Phoenix, uh, who were part of this in event in cooperation with the Ascenta. Uh, second, uh, we have not yet uh, coupled sortition with rotation. And it is crucial. My friend uh, Graham Smith wrote this in the chat. It's crucial. Sortition is useful when it is uh, coupled to a sortition, uh, rotation. a rotation of offices and position, which should be even quicker than the rotation of offices uh, for uh, when they are elected. So there was a question about the, the image. Uh, on the front of the of the the book, uh, it was it was uh, it is uh, the image of the goodness for, uh, of the goodness occasion occasion because at that time in the Renaissance the goodness occasion occasion and the goodness fortuna melt before fortuna. It, the, the most important image of Fortuna figure was the wheel of Fortuna, which is like seasons, like life. It's a regular process, uh, and Sortition was sought in this uh, perspective during the Middle Age. But then come Ocasio, and Ocasio, uh, her, her uh, head is shaved, except in the back, where she has long hairs. And when she passes, you have to catch her uh, hairs uh, in order to get the occasion, to, to size the occasion. And uh, to add a, a personal comment, when I was working on this, I met with my wife and we both had the feeling that we were able to size the occasion. So it was also a personal um, illustration. Then quickly, uh, I think sortition is interesting because, as Arcon said, uh, our democracy is broken at the time being. And it's not just in one country, just not for a couple of years. There is a structural problem, which doesn't mean that we have to abolish elections, but it means that we have to increase and change a lot of uh, democratic processes. Uh, second, um, about what Jenny said about advisory and binding and empowered. I do agree, you are completely right, that we have to play on a variety of uh, sortition bodies, many publics and so on, some advisory, uh, some binding, but only in a few cases, I guess. Uh, I think that in most cases, they can be empowered without being binding. In Ireland, it was a proposal, 
which mm -hmm. then passed, passed through the parliament and was voted by the people at large. And I think that in most cases, this is a good way to do. But for the Supreme Court, for example, if we revise the, uh, the constitution of the Supreme Court, then this body could have binding decisions as a Supreme Court as at the time being. So we have to differentiate a, 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 a different set of, of uh, mini publics. The most uh, dangerous uh, thing at the time being is that most mini publics are only advisory and that in a lot of cases, when they tackle really difficult decisions and when they face real power structures, they are not efficient. So that it is, I think, very important to stress this empowerment and this possibility of binding decisions in some cases in order to go beyond the actual state of many publics, which is not satisfactory and which can lead just to a fake democratization of democracy with new institutions uh, which are not able to really face the challenges of the future. And if they do not change every day life uh, of citizens, then uh, it won't be very valuable. A last comment. Uh, again, uh, on what Arkham said, I think that one of the most interesting dimension of sortition is in history, as you said, was this capacity or this potential, at least, to mitigate conflicts, to mitigate power relations, That's and that we need this today, when a lot of citizens have the feeling that politicians are acting just for their interests and their party and their career, and not for the common good of the people. But, and there is a bad, some activists who, uh, who claim uh, that sortition bodies should rule also have an imaginary which I call anti-political. They think that we can get rid of conflict, that we can get rid of power relations, that we can get rid of pluralism. And I think this is not realistic and it is not very appealing neither. So we have to play on these both levels, mitigating without, without getting rid of. And I think that is in this ecosystemic perspective that sortition is interesting. Thank you, Eve. So um, maybe before um, I come back to Arkan and Jenny, I'll go through some of the uh, some of our participants' questions, and then you can reflect uh, kind of more uh, more generally as as well. So I think, well, Rob, I think your um, question has been answered about the significance of the of the photo. It's about seizing um, the uh, the opportunity. So we have an anonymous attendee who's asked. You know, what are the challenges with sortition? Is there is anarchy a risk? Um, what about the uh, the issue about money and politics? Um, what sort of guarantees can you have that if you randomly select a group of people that you won't end up with the same sort of incentives, that they won't be corrupted by vested interests or, or whatever? So um, I guess I'd throw that open to all three of you. Maybe Jenny first and then Eve. You are muted. The current assemblies are relatively short. Um, so citizens are brought together for a weekend, five weekends, six weekends. Um, you could bribe them. Um, there are a lot of them. You'd have to get to, you'd have to sort of find ways of getting to them that were secret. It's not an, they're not established networks. You can't set up anything ahead of time. You'd have to find a way of getting to Jenny, you know, and, and then making me, a, offering me a bribe without my then turning on you and, and turning you in. It's, it's not that easy. Now, if we were to have citizens assemblies that were elected, that were a, a, a randomly selected and brought together for a year, 
or two years or three years, if it was a separate chamber, some people have suggested that, the, you know, for example, the House of Lords be turned into a selected body, then there would be some chance of making the kinds of connections that you could use both to bribe, but also to do the kind of bribery that's much more usual these days, which is to offer a job afterwards and so forth, things that are kind of legal bribery. But presently, for these short-term citizens' assemblies, um, the effect of money would appear primarily in the information the citizens get, but there's almost everything that's being done. The information that people get is very well uh, accepted by the different part, you know, the different um, advocacy groups on both sides. So there's not much room for 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 the effects of money right now. Now I have been convinced by Graham Smith that uh, for these reasons. Uh, the <clears throat> these positions have to be only for short terms. Otherwise, we'll get again in the usual game that we face now, and which is not satisfactory in um, elected uh, uh, chambers. And, and because it and, should. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and there is an additional possibility, namely that the, the assemblies, uh, Sortition selected assembly could then choose topics on which other mini publics can uh, meet for a specific question, for a short term question. This is a way in which it is done in uh, East Belgium. And I think this is also a promising way of dealing with this problem, potential problem. Right. And because it's short term, obviously the citizens can't develop tremendous expertise in this subject. You'd be surprised at the expertise they can develop, but they can't develop the kind of expertise that a representative might have if they're the representative who worked on it for several, an issue for several terms. Granted, I mean, that, so that's that's a negative to the short. That's why it's good to have a mixture of things. I, I just want to add a coming from a different direction. Um, if these things become more common, I think it will be important to establish like the culture and the norms of what it means to be non-corrupt. And so some of the most gripping passages from Eve's book and the early part were that the figure of a young boy drawing the lot out of an urn or just occurs again and again and again. And so that is like this cultural and how I read it is cultural embeddedness of innocence. And if you try to corrupt this thing, you're a horrible person because there's this symbol of innocence, which is the young boy. So how to like we think of a, you know, a politician taking a big bag of money is kind of normal these days. And we accept it, at least in the United States. Right. So like the Citizen Assembly could become that, too. It's a cultural effort and construct for it not to be that. And yeah, just to say in um, in Ireland, one of the rules is that if you attempt to to lobby or in any way intercede with any of the citizen members of the citizen assembly, that you won't be allowed to present as an interest group or a, an advocacy group. So there's a, there's kind of norms ag against that to try to dissuade the advocacy groups. There, there were worries, especially with abortion. That some of the groups could attempt to uh, to discuss things with people in a small country, they might be recognisable. Okay, so we move on to the next question, which is from Thorsten. Um, so Thorsten is asking you, Jenny, what do you say to the people um, who think that the stratified procedure with the quotas for different identities of people is actually identitarian politics? I would say it depends how it's done, but in the usual way and in the actually the, the very, very much more usual way, the um, the stress is simply on trying to uh, make a representative sample out of a sample that might would by self-selection not be representative. And that's not true in every single case. And I think of British Columbia um, as one. British Columbia established there would be half men and half women on a topic of that was the um, voting system. Now, it's not in the slightest bit clear why men or women would have any different sort of opinions on um, or interests 
on the, the voting system. So why would you make a big deal of men and women? You could call that identitarian politics. I think it was just a, sort of a knee jerk feeling of um, the sort of maybe more men would would agree or. I, I, I never I never interviewed people about why, but it was, certainly wasn't that Canada, that the British Columbia was raging with identity politics around uh, around gender at the time. Uh, they just put in those two categories. But most of the time, those categories are are put in simply to rectify existing imbalances. I'm not saying that in some cases, particularly indigenous or where you might want to say, let's have a slightly disproportionate, let's have a little bit more than proportional in order to get the perspectives of a group that might, and as, as in British Columbia, it happened that the random selection didn't bring up any indigenous people, but you'd want some indigenous voices just in case there was some kind of um, special knowledge or interest that could be brought to the table. So you could have identity politics around it, but it hasn't, uh, to my knowledge, much happened. And so I see this as a kind of um, straw man. Many people make this argument, and I think it's just that they're reacting to the fact that that anybody's thinking in terms of groups. Oh, my God, you can't think in terms of groups. But you have to think in terms of groups because some groups have somewhat different perspectives and interests and experiences. And you want those experiences to be brought but the, you want to think about the relevant groups. In general, a random selection will bring in all those, those experiences or many of them. But if there's systematic biases in the acceptance process, then you have to work against it. That's all that's going on. Okay, thank you. We have an interesting question as well now from Stefano. Uh, he's uh, one of the guarantors of the Bologna Climate Citizens Assembly. Um, and they discussed a kind of mirror majorities mechanism, he says, where if the assembly passes a recommendation with 70 percent, uh, the city council can only reject it with the same majority. And I know like in Scotland, they had some of the same sort of things with some arbitrary number where, you know, there was different levels. Um, so. Stefano thinks it might be an interesting solution to step into the kind of greater empowerment of mini publics. Um, but what do you all think about it? Who wants to go first? I, I, I can perhaps go first. <clears throat> I think it's a really interesting proposal. And it's another example of what uh, Jenny was uh, speaking about. Uh, I mean, it's incredible that in these experiments, democratic imagination is flourishing. And we need in this period of broken democracy, uh, democratic imagination to flourish. And this particular proposal, I think, is very convincing. It makes the mini public empowered to some extent, not the on the, the last um, decision making body, but with a real power. It's not just an advice, but in order to refuse what has been proposed, then you have to get the same. Uh, majority. I think it's really interesting for me. Jenny or Arkham, would you have a, a brief different view? No? I agree. I, I totally agree. I wonder if I could say one thing about the uh, conflict management, kind of in the grip of deliberative mini publics, a la deliberative polls, right? What's doing the work there is some sort of representative sample. But I think that it's important that I think what's doing a bunch of the work in conflict management is just uncertainty, right? And so what I wanna say is like in an America where things are so polarized and you feel that the, the threat is existential if the other side gets power. And you know this is true in Europe too, you know, you feel like, oh, if AFD Alternative for Deutschland gets too many seats, it's gonna be the end of the world. Or if Graham and his friends in Extinction Rebellion get too many seats, it's gonna be the end of England, right? Um, and so the incentives in the, for that existential threat are to accumulate as much political power as you possibly can to make sure that that doesn't happen, to protect yourself from the existential threat. But if you allocate, if it's a, it's a dis distributive aristocracy, as Eve says, and you allocate power positions randomly and that mechanism is protected, there's no way it's just written in that you cannot accumulate sufficient political power to guarantee that Extension Rebellion or AFD won't be in the mix. So you better learn to live with that. And so it develops a whole different set of muscles 
that I think are going to be more productive for a democracy in which people have very wide ranges of disagreement in which now they feel an existential threat. And the main things that you do to counter that existential threat undermine democracy itself, which is accumulating as much political power as you can. Thank you, Arkham. Mm -hmm. Jenny? This is not on this subject, but it's on the subject of conflict. A number of, of these groups, these deliberative mini publics, um, begin with the small group coming together to ask questions of the expert in the next in the next larger session um, before they even start discussing the, the, the subject at hand. And what that does, it's really interesting to watch. It gives the small group a common task before they actually start talking about the politics of it. And um, since there are many small groups, and since there's not enough time to ask to answer all of to ask all of their questions, the groups very quickly get that they want to have a well-worded question because then their question will be asked. If they have a badly worded question, the moderator won't won't pick it. So they've got a task. And they work together on it and they get excited about it. And when they get to ask their question, the illustrious group 13 asks the following question. They're proud of the question. And when they have come to a good wording, I've seen the equivalent of high fives. Yes, that was really good wording. So there are, and that's just one example of group building, what's called group building. There are many ways of, that's a very quick way because it's quite integral to the subject matter. You don't have to have a special exercise, but uh, this is a, this is not what you're talking about, but it's about the problem, the question of how you deal with polarization. And you can deal with polarization extraordinarily effectively by giving people a simple common task right at the beginning. Okay, thank you, Jane. So we're really coming up against time now. And I think that pretty much answered the last question from the uh, an anonymous. And so Eve, maybe we'll ask you to, uh, to wrap up. There is one final question, which was about... Um, What's the no. difference between all of these and British parliamentary consultative committees? So you can address that or not as, as you uh, I'm as afraid I'm give not, you the final word. I'm afraid I don't know enough the British parliamentary committees to really answer the questions, but I'm pretty confident that uh, uh, introducing sortition within the English political system could only make this system better than it is now. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. And thank you to all of our participants and for your wonderful questions. Um, thank you so much to the, to the four speakers who really, I think, brought, uh, brought the whole question alive. And uh, thank you to uh, the Harvard and the Ash Center for hosting this. It's, Fantastic to be able to have such an intercontinental discussion of a of a Thursday afternoon, and thank you to Eve for uh, for writing and having published such an excellent book that covers such a huge arc on sortition. I think it'll be essential reading. So thank you all. Thank you, Jane, for such excellent moderation. Thank you all. Take care.